Are you a patient person? That might be an easy question. It might be a hard question. But do you consider yourself to be a patient individual? I think our society, and specifically our culture within the Northeast of the U.S. here, has almost bred a default position of impatience in what we value. Because if you think about it, we value speed, convenience, and efficiency very, very highly. So if you place your prime overnight order on Amazon and it's supposed to arrive between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m., but it doesn't come until noon, how do you react? If you go to the doctor's office and you're waiting for the doctor, because let's face facts, doctors are never on time, no offense to any doctors. I've been the first appointment and waited 30 minutes to see my doctor. Are they ever on time? No. How do you react in those scenarios? When you're at a traffic light and the person in front of you doesn't move when that light turns green, do you immediately hit the horn? Do you count to three and hit the horn? Do you roll the window down and scream? Do you drive around them? Or do you just sit there and wait for them to move? My point is that your ability to be patient plays into how these questions are answered. And my point is also that we have different levels of patience. I jokingly say that I'm situationally patient. It depends on the situation. But there are times where you're required to exercise that patience, and it can weigh very heavily on your ability to be patient the longer you wait. Today we're going to talk about David, King David, the second king of Israel, and a challenging situation that he faced where his patience was tested. And there are three things that we will learn from this patience trial that he goes under that will help us when we encounter situations like this ourselves in the future. We're continuing our series today that we've called Prayer for Normal People. Still wondering why I'm in this room. <laughs> I am anything but normal. But the point is, we've been working our way through psalms, various different psalms that we have selected that have helped us learn different things about prayer in our lives. And they've circled around themes that we can all relate to. Fear, failure, anger, fear of failure, and today, patience or impatience. As a part of the series, we've been using an acrostic, using the word pray. And it's a guideline, something that you can use. It's, it's not the perfect brownie recipe for how you should pray, but it is something that you can rely upon when you get to that point where you're not quite sure what to pray or how to pray. And the P stands for pause, the R for rejoice, the A for ask, and the Y for yield. And as we continue today, we're going to look at Psalm 13. And Psalm 13 is considered a lament psalm. So this is an outward expression of grief or sorrow coming from David. And in this psalm, as I mentioned, there are three things that we will learn about patience that will help us in the future. But I would like to start by reading this psalm to you. Now, throughout the series, we've all stood together and said the psalm out loud. Last week, Mark changed it a little bit, and I want to do that again this week. Stay seated, indulge me for a minute, and close your eyes as I read this short psalm. Really listen to the words of this psalm as I read it, and see how it applies to you. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. 
My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. The beginning of this psalm is a very raw, passionate prayer to God. David is expressing his feelings, and he just wants action. Now, Rachel and I have this unwritten rule, and honestly, it's unspoken, so Rachel, now you know, that we have to share a story about our dog in every message that we give. (laughs) So warning, dog story incoming. Our dog's name is Moose. Moose is an English bulldog. If you don't know anything about English bulldogs, they are the most stubborn dogs on the face of this earth. It's in their breed. They don't want to do what you want them to do. They want to do what they want to do. And that's how they roll. Well, Moose is still a puppy, and we're still training him. So when he's at home during the day, and there's no one else there except for me, and I work from home most days of the week, he has to stay in his crate. We created this little play area. I call it his castle. That's a long story. But we put him in his castle so that he's safe and doesn't get into trouble. But I feel bad that Moose is in his crate all day long. So if I get time in between meetings, I will go take him for a walk. Now, Moose has spoiled me several times with very good walks where we walk through our cul-de-sac and he stays right with me. And it's a great walk. Can't go that far. He's a bulldog. (laughs) But there are other times where it's not that way. And it always happens when I only have like five or ten minutes between meetings, and I say, let me take him out real quick, and we run outside, and we get to the street, and Moose does this. He lays down in the middle of the road. He does not move. That picture, it was like 100 degrees out, and this kid is baking on the pavement like a little cinnamon roll is what he looks like. And if you pull on his leash, he drags across the pavement. He will not get up. Have you seen the videos of people dragging their bulldogs through Home Depot? Yeah, no, that is very real. And I find myself pleading with him, how long are you going to remain on this pavement? I've got 15 people in my next meeting waiting for me. I have to actually say stuff. Get up. How long are you going to make me wait for you? And I feel like David totally different situation, obviously, where I'm pleading with Moose, but David is pleading with God. He says, how long? Four times in this psalm. And we know from ancient Hebrew literature that this was a common technique that was used when you repeated something in this fashion, fashion, it was to emphasize a very specific point. David says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? How long will my enemy triumph over me? You get the feeling that David, (laughs) he's been waiting to hear God respond. And it's not like he just started praying about this today or yesterday or even last week. He's been praying for a long time. And God is not responding. But you can feel his emotion just jump off of the page. How long? And this leads me to the first thing that we can learn this morning about patience. And that is, patience has no defined timeline. You never know just how long you're going to have to accept or tolerate the pain, the challenge, or the suffering that you're enduring. You also don't know how long God is going to take to respond when you pray, or how he's going to respond. But the longer you wait, the harder it is to wait. I think one of the greatest stories of impatience in the Old Testament comes from Exodus. And it's When you have the uh, Israelites are in the wilderness with Moses, with God, and Moses is summoned up onto the top of Mount Sinai. They've just been dramatically uh, rescued from Egypt. But Moses has been summoned to the top of Mount Sinai, and the Israelites are left waiting for him. But he's up there for a long time. 
And the Israelites start to grow impatient. And in Exodus chapter 32, we read the following. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. And here comes one of my favorite lines in the entire Bible. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Like they don't know who Moses is, where he is, and who he's talking to. Yet they've grown impatient. And they convince Aaron to create for them an idol, a god, a golden calf, a god that they could control. Now in his book, Disobedient God, Albert Tate references this exact same situation, and he wrote the following. Let's set the scene. It's the children of Israel. They've been delivered out of Egypt. They've seen God's hand of faithfulness. He came in, he set them free, he brought them out. Now Moses is up on the mountain with God, and we later find out that he's giving Moses the vision of how to love him through the Ten Commandments. It's a vision Moses is to give the children of Israel. It's pretty important. But the people aren't up on the mountain with Moses. They're waiting. And they're waiting. They've come out of Egypt and they've passed through the Red Sea that God parted for them. God has spared them, but now they're just waiting. And in their waiting, they grow frustrated and weary to the point where they look at Moses' brother and right-hand man Aaron and say, Aaron, God is taking too long. He's not following our timeline. He's not moving according to the schedule that we anticipated. God is not following our instructions. God is way off script. God is being disobedient. <laughs> this was the result of their impatience. I have found that how you respond in challenging situations doesn't just say something about you as a person, but it also shapes you when you encounter future situations like this going forward. When we hit challenging situations, we tend to fall back on what we know best, what we trust most. And in this situation, the Israelites went to themselves and they said, God has, as he says, gone off script. He's not following our timeline. So they pulled a God that they could control. Do you think they did this because they really didn't trust Moses or that they didn't trust God? I mean, how long was long enough? Moses was up there for 40 days, so apparently that was too long. But in Psalm 13, David asks God, when are you going to stop ignoring me? When are you going to answer me? How long must I wait? Have you ever prayed this prayer? I know I have. Have you ever thought that God was not following your timeline? That he was being disobedient? That he had gone off script, as Albert Tate says? It well, feels like David did, and he's expressing it. It's been going on for so long that you get the sense that David feels abandoned by God. I mean, he repeats how long four times. He hasn't heard from God in a long time, and he's actually wondering if he is ever going to answer. He feels alone and isolated, abandoned. Have you ever felt that way? Alone, abandoned by God? There's a danger with this. Mark, uh, our lead pastor Mark, has referenced this in the past. He actually just brought this up during our Wednesday night men's event. In May of this year, the Surgeon General released an advisory regarding the devastating impact of loneliness and isolation. And they said something very interesting that I want to read to you. They said, even before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Approximately half of U.S. adults reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. Disconnection fundamentally affects our mental, physical, and societal health. 
In fact, loneliness and isolation increase the risk for individuals to develop mental health challenges in their lives. And lacking connection can increase the risk for premature death to levels comparable to smoking daily. I don't smoke daily because I don't want to die prematurely. But loneliness? Holy cow. Now look, I know some of you like to be alone sometimes. I do too. I get it. But we're talking about prolonged feelings like this. So when I read Psalm 13, I kind of get what David's saying. Because it causes me to reflect on times when I have been severely depressed. And especially on times when I've been ridiculously angry. Periods of anger. Because I feel alone during those times. And I can almost feel that physical impact on me when I have those times. So when David cries out to God, saying, when are you going to respond? You get it. But he very specifically says one thing. He says, how long will you hide your face from me? We know from other Bible passages that when God's face shines upon you, when it turns toward you, that it is a time of tremendous blessing of God's favor. So when God turns his face away from you, it is the absence of that blessing, the absence of that favor. And David is feeling this right here because he knows God's blessings. He, know how good, he knows how good God has been to him, but he feels the absence of it now. And maybe you know how that feels. Like God is not putting his favor or blessings, pushing them in your direction. When I... Uh, was baptized and first started following Jesus. I remember the period of time immediately after that. It was one of the best times of my life because I don't really know how to put this into words other than to say it felt like I could constantly feel God's presence around me like it was a hug. It's the only way that I can describe it. I was reading my Bible daily, praying, talking to God all the time. I could feel his presence, and it felt like he was listening and responding to me. It was a fantastic time. It was very transformational for me because it was so positive, and I was able to see things that weren't that great in my character and able to start to make some changes. But then that period ended, and it didn't feel like God was there every single day anymore. I was still reading my Bible, still praying, still talking to him throughout the day. But he wasn't responding the way that he was before. And when I look back on those periods, because that wasn't the only time that I felt this way. When I look on those periods, those are times where I've probably had my greatest growth because I didn't realize it at the time, but God was shaping me in a very different way and preparing me for the next season. I think it's easy to get caught up in the thought that a relationship with Jesus is constantly positive. Like every day is going to be great now that you have Jesus, now that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And a relationship with Jesus is absolutely amazing and very transformational. I would trade it for nothing. But it's not always roses and sunshine every single day, is it? There are some days where you feel like maybe Jesus is ghosting you. And no matter how many times you call out to him or how many different ways, he doesn't always respond. You start to feel like David, a little abandoned. Now, I think this, this, there's this uh, perception as Christians to feel like the, the abundant life that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10, verse 10, that we should feel that at every moment and at all times. So when you feel this feeling of abandonment, it's tough to handle sometimes. But how easy is it for you to share that feeling with others? What about your Christian friends? 
If you share it with them, do you feel like they're going to respond in a way that's kind of like, man, what the heck are they talking about? They just, they just don't have their stuff together. What about your non-Christian friends? If you share it with them, you might have a fear that you're going to push them further from Jesus, right? Because if this Jesus guy is so great, why should you ever feel abandoned? Shouldn't everything be good all of the time? This is why I love Psalms like Psalm 13, because David clearly has had a relationship with God. He has felt his favor, felt his blessings. But here he's asking, how long? Over and over again. He breaks through the silence of his patience to make some very bold requests because he does not know God's timeline. And he's letting him know exactly how he feels. And this leads me to the second point this morning, and that is patience is not silence. When you're trying to be patient, you do not need to remain silent, especially in your relationship with God. And in this psalm, David makes three very specific requests, and they're very bold. And I mean, the guy's just looking for a response from God, a divine response. He says, the first request, look on me. The second one, answer. And then he says, Lord, my God. I'll come back to that in a second. But then he says, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. David is effectively saying, look, dude, I need a response or I am going to die. That is a bold request. David's leaning into the belief that God does not want David's enemies to triumph over him. And he does this by using a very specific name. Our translation says, Lord, my God. If you look at the Hebrew translation, it says Yahweh. The very personal, intimate name of God. So in the midst of all of this, in his passion, in his raw expression of emotion, he busts out the personal name of God and effectively says, I still love you. And I know that you still love me. I just need a response. And he starts by saying, look on me. Have you ever started a conversation with someone or had at the tail end and start, you needed their attention, so you started by saying, look. People have said that to me many times, and, and I look at them. But that's not what they're talking about, and I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, I used to do this thing with, you remember the old metal, uh, like a metal fly swatters with the rubber plastic end on it? I used to use that as a sword in my house. And every once in a while, I'd really get into the battle. Well, I remember this one day where I was, I don't know who I was fighting, I don't know what kind of sword my fly swatter was, doesn't matter, but my mother had these tall cream-colored figurines in the house, and they were women uh, in a kimono holding a fan, you know, with their hair up in the bun and everything, and I was really getting into it. Well, the battle was going so well that I just completely sliced her head clean off. And I remember this because I can picture the head tumbling through the air. You know the little sticks that hold the bun in place? I can see the sticks twisting through the air, as her head hit the table and then the floor. And my mother went off on me, and rightfully so. But I remember trying to get her attention because I was trying to tell her that it was an accident and I really wasn't trying to do it. And I said, look, mom. Now that might not have been the right tone <laughs> to use in that scenario, but when someone says look, they don't want you to physically look at you. They want you to look at you from your heart and your mind and actually hear what they're about to say. And this is what David is saying to God, look and answer, because I just said some things and I need to hear something back from you. But then he says, give light to my eyes. In other Psalms, we hear requests like this, where the psalmist will say, deliver me, lead me, save my life, rise up. These are all very similar. And the whole point is, they want something to be done. It is a cry for help. 
You know, God wants us to be patient, to listen to him, to wait, but he also wants you to express your feelings to him, your very raw, uncut feelings. But there's one last element that's involved here, and that is our last point. It involves trust. Patience is fueled by your trust. There's a very clear relationship between the two, patience and trust. When you're sitting in that doctor's office waiting room and you're waiting for 30 minutes beyond your appointment time, do you trust that the doctor is going to see you at some point? Yeah, that's why you stay there and that's why you wait. If you're at a restaurant and the food is taking forever to come, do you just get up and walk out? Or do you trust that the kitchen staff and the wait staff are eventually going to bring you your food? Yes, you trust. This is the essence of what we're getting to here in the psalm. This is David's exact situation in his prayer. He's saying, look, I trust you. I know that you're going to respond. I just need it pretty soon. As I was preparing for this message, I came across a quote from Joyce Meyer. And it is so appropriate regarding the relationship between trust and patience. She wrote the following. I believe, that trust is a tr- I believe that a trusting attitude and a patient attitude go hand in hand. When you let go and learn to trust God, it releases joy in your life. And when you trust God, you're able to be more patient. Patience is not just about waiting for something. It's about how you wait or the attitude while waiting. Paul touches on this in the beginning of his letter to James when he says he counts it as pure joy, all of the trials and challenges that he has faced. Joy. And David responds at the end of the psalm with joy and trust. I mean, he's basically just yelled at God and demanded a response in a somewhat loving way, using the name Yahweh. But then he says this, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. David is effectively telling God that despite his feelings, despite his concerns, despite the amount of time that he has been waiting, he trusts The guy could die, and he still waits patiently for God's response. And as Joyce Meyer points out, when he trusts God, it releases a sense of joy. And this is the key to being patient during times when you feel like God has abandoned you. In our pray acrostic, step number two is rejoice. Now, in Psalm 13, David jumps straight to the ask and comes back to the rejoice, and that's okay. But when you pause and you rejoice first, I think that makes the ask that much more meaningful. And you go into the ask of your prayer on the heels of joy, remembering the good that God has already done in your life. Remembering, remembering the good that he has done in this world and in your relationship. And I think that helps us to remain a little bit more patient during those times when we feel anything but patient. But do you trust God? When Jesus was on the cross, he prayed a prayer that was very similar to what David shares in verses one through four. He says, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is basically saying, God, you have turned your face away from me. I no longer feel your blessings. I no longer feel your favor. He didn't like it. In, uh, in his devotional Songs of Jesus, and if you're looking for a good devotional to follow, I love this one. It's by Tim Keller, and he goes through the Psalms, 365 days, 
he touches on this exact point when he touches on Psalm 13. And I wanted to share this with you today. Here's what he wrote. David is in agony and can't feel the presence of God. He cries out that God has ignored his pain and his sorrow. It is almost a howl. And the fact that it is included in the Bible tells us that God wants to hear our genuine feelings, even if they are anger at him. David never stops praying, however, and that is the key. As long as we howl toward God and remember his salvation by grace, we will end at a place of peace. If Christians do that by hearing Jesus praying verses 1 through 4 on the cross, losing the Father's face as he paid for our sins, we will be able to pray verses 5 through 6 indeed. Before Jesus went to the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed a very specific prayer. First, he said, take this cup. In other words, God, change what is about to happen. Because Jesus knew the pain that he was about to go through. He knew the suffering that he would have to endure. He's asking for God to change. But then the trust comes into play. And Jesus says one very key thing. Not my will, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus trusts the Father with his life on his way to the cross. David trusts God with his life in his prayer. And if these guys can trust God with their lives, you can certainly trust him with yours.